think we're using duct tape and glue. Yeah, we're looking at we're looking at ways to fix this. All right, hi everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the War and Astronomical Society. I'm Bob Tremblay, your president. What were you thinking? Um, okay. Um, yeah, well, there you go. If you haven't renewed your membership, you can do so via PayPal online or talk to that guy right there during the uh, break. Um, we have uh, we are going to be having in-person meetings at Macomb starting in March. Yay, Dale Parton has uh, talked with them and we're big. Thank you, Dale. And we are going to be meeting in the E building. We will not be meeting in the library. We're, we're before we in the E building where we were meeting during the summer before it, a little west of the library. South Campus. South Campus. We'll be sending out an email with a map and all that information to everybody so you'll be able to get it. But, but we are returning to in person meetings, and Macomb has internet that doesn't have to be fought, and they have, <laughs> yeah, some good facilities. So. Uh, GLAC meetings are uh, the second Thursday of the month coming up. If you're interested in astronomy at the beach and like it, we could use some representation there. We can certainly use your help. Um, we could use some AV assistance. Adrian does not want to do it anymore. So if anybody would like to be an AV minion, we could use your help. He's having too much fun, so he needs some. Yeah, he wants to share the fun. That's right. Yeah, each time, each time we're, we're bringing it, we're making it work. But... You know, it's, I but think he, he needs to be doing board stuff, yeah. not AV stuff. So we There's need to be able to help with oh, that. Exactly. Okay, I had a meeting with uh, our Metro Parks rep and a new volunteer services rep. And um, I created a document which I will be sending out to the membership. They would like to do several different astronomy events this year at Stony Creek, Indian Springs, and Kensington. Kensington is going to be the place where we used to hold astronomy at the beach, where they leveled that and they rebuilt stuff. I saw the uh, the locations on Google Maps. They look pretty good, but they'd like to have us do a site visit. So I'm, uh, I'd like to have a couple members go so and check I've the sites out. Been to there now? Do they want us to visit sites directly? Yeah, because I've been to all three of those. Indian Springs is probably the darkest one. Cool. So I am I am I'm working right now. I've got an email out with, with our rep, and we are going to be organizing a uh, a site visit. My wife and I are going to go at the very least. But the, um, they also we're, they're going to be working with us. They'd like us to man these events, and um, uh, also GLAC members. So we'd like we'd like to pull all the astronomy clubs in and get them some support. Now the events in November, they, uh, they are having two events in November, one of which yeah, corresponds with International Observe the Moon Night. Um, they're calling it uh, the Night of the Dragon. They're expecting several hundred attendees. They want to get tents like Astronomy at the Beach. They actually asked me to get the prices and who getting the tents from Astronomy at the Beach. And they want to get food trucks and that. So you guys are handling all that, right? Because we don't want to do that. But yeah, they're, they're planning on doing that. So. And they also put the Perseids party uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the list for uh, the summer at, at both at Stony Creek and at Wolcott Mill. So they are, they are ramping up. I still have to see the waiver they want our volunteers to sign. This was a, this is why we stopped going to Kensington because the waiver they wanted us to sign was very onerous. They told me that because of that, they have changed the wording. And so I get to see the wording. So hopefully, I'm hopeful the wording is going to be acceptable to everyone. So officer reports, that was my officer reports. Um, first VP, Dale, wanna? Come up there. Yeah, come on up here. And uh, this is where it gets broadcast. Uh, everyone. This is our first vice president, Dale Parton. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we are looking a lot better in terms of speakers lined up to speak for the next few months. Uh, I'm still looking for speakers more for the second half of the year. Both people to give a full hour long uh, presentation and a short 10 to 15 minute presentation. Uh, so please get back to me if you have something in mind. Doesn't have to be perfect yet, just an idea or something you'd like to, to, to speak on. Okay, thank you. 
And if you have anything you'd like us to speak on, let us know about that. Yeah, if you have a topic you're interested in, but you'd like to ask that somebody else prepare a presentation on that, I could try to arrange that. Thank you. All righty, first VP. All right. Um, Secretary's report. Whoa. What? Chain of command. Sorry. Observing. Second ZP. Observatory <laughs> report. Do you remember? I used to rule with an iron fist. Uh, all right. Uh, Stargate is doing all right. The January open house was pretty cloudy. We had a Girl Scout group come out, rehabbed, uh, gave them the tour, talked about astronomy. We had a great time. We briefly saw the moon through the Michigan Nebula. That counts as a conjunction. So uh, February open house, 25th, Saturday, 6 p.m. It's going to be crystal clear, the best observing. Uh, I am also your snack coordinator, so I'm going to be finding people to bring food to the upcoming meetings. I am also the discussion group coordinator. So if you would like people to come to your home and talk about astronomy, it's a thing we used to do in the olden times, uh, come at me and we'll get you scheduled. Thank you. Just gotta find someone to host or bring it to the observatory. The observatory would be the first one. Okay, treasure, Adrian. All right. My other job Back up here. Yes, your real job. <laughs> the real job. So um, we have over thirty thousand in the tank again in our account, thanks to you. I've watched way too much ASMR where they do that. Um, thanks to you all renewing your memberships. If you would like to renew your membership here. I got money, I got a PayPal thing. I can show you how to get to PayPal on your phone um, or I will accept cash or check and we will cash check. I think we have Kathleen, I think you're... Okay, good. Um, but that's great, we could hear you because of our rigging setup that we made work. So, um, oh God. 30,000 in the bank, um, PayPal around 500 or so, and petty cash, um, we still have around 500 on hand in petty cash. So we can give you change for your snacks. We can renew memberships by check or cash. We can write down what your membership is. We're also, I'm also happy to report that we have a few astronomical league um, renewals going on as well, which is nice. Um, so I do recommend, uh, because it's not only because I'm an Astronomical League member, I know members on the board of the Astronomical League, um, I do recommend either becoming or re-upping your Astronomical League membership. Um, there are some benefits to it, one of which I believe Baton Rouge is the next conference, but then there's also online there's plenty of online stuff you can do with the Astronomical League with opportunities to win door prizes. If you go to the Explore Scientific Global Star Party, of which our own David, myself, um, a few other astro um, astronomy dignitaries are a part of. Um, and that's every Tuesday night, usually starting around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can log in. Um, if you're interested in logging into that, um, let me know and I'll send the link. And other than that, if you have other questions about the treasury, come and see me and I will make up an answer for you. Most of it will be true. And um, any questions about membership, you can ask. You can check the uh, warrenastro.org site. Um, that'll lead you to the PayPal site, which is the best and fastest way to send in your dues. If you still want to mail it in to our post office box, it's listed on that website as well. So I have taken up enough time. I will now transfer it back to our president. Right. Thank you, Adrian. Outreach, Kevin, can, are you are you available to do a, an outreach report? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, just real quick. Uh, Mark Kedzier is doing a talk. Um, 
at the Warren Civic Library on March 1st, and also a family science night at a local uh, elementary school on the 16th of February. Um, Dale Parton's doing a talk at Troy Public Library on 20 February, and Bob Tremblay's doing a presentation tomorrow night at the Warren uh, Library. Um, in terms of the other outreach, Bob already uh, covered it, and I'll just let him, we'll just go off what he said. All righty. Thank you. All right. Um, secretary's report I have here. January meeting minutes are in the February WAS. We still have six 2023 calendars available. And please see the secretary, Mark Hedger, or treasurer uh, during the break to purchase one. So that, that is the uh, secretary report. All right. Uh, publications, Dale. Okay. Um, the February WASP is online, of course. And um, the, the big news tonight is that uh, last week, uh, we last weekend, we managed to move the Warren Astro site onto our own WAS account. So now we're paying the bills for that instead of an individual. So progress. And that's my report. Tired of paying his money for our organization, so now we pay it. It hasn't done much to dent our uh, overall spend versus what we bring in, so we're more than happy to do that. All right, so do we have any new guests here tonight? People have got yes. Oh wow, we have three. Hi, how'd you find out about us? How'd, how'd you find out about us online? Had emails over the time. Yeah, probably by email. Anybody else? Hodge? Yeah, I was a member some years ago. You the fellow that called me this weekend? You were the fellow that called me this weekend. All right. And you're our guest, right? Yes. Our speaker. Okay. Well, all right. Well, okay. We have we have new people. Always finding new people. You can find us online at Meetup and at WarrenAstro.org. All right. Um, special interest groups. So let's do solar first. Marty, how's the sun? <clears throat> Marty, how's the sun? Mistaken, it's very, very, very. Yeah. The order of the mic is necessary. We can. Yeah, you got it. I talk loud. It's a big moment. The past couple weeks, the sun's actually been uh, not very active. It's just starting to get back up again. So it seems like one side's active, one side's not. Uh, just the two spots on the sun right now, but right on the edge is a little bit bigger sunspot. So looks like we're coming back around to the more active part of the sun so get started looking at it again yeah my uh i've got uh the spaceweather.com uh solar flare app on my cell phone and uh, uh my, my cell phone the past couple of weeks has been wanting to like vibrate off my desk with announcements of solar flares so that's pretty funny so uh riyadh is riyadh here you double stars yeah hi um we have uh, our um, new spectrum analyzer uh, at the observatory now. So hopefully starting uh, with the next open house, as soon as it is going to be clear, we will start learning to use it and uh, start to experiment with it. Ooh, experiments. Awesome. All right, um, David, you, you'd be a special interest group. Well, thank you. I I just wanted to say for observing that um, uh, the sun has gotten a lot quieter lately. Today, I got two groups with about 17 spots and 15 prominences. So it's quieting down, but uh, not so much. It's, it's still pretty darn active. All right. Uh, we, we had, I believe, a radio astronomy. Special interest group. Jim Chetlowski and Marty, I think. Uh, Anybody doing radio? I would like to see us do some radio astronomy. Any other special interest group before we go on to observing reports? No? All right. Back there. Observing reports. What have you guys seen in the sky? I, uh, I, uh, I have a, a skylight in my kitchen, and I can see a small sliver of the sky, and then two days of well, the month I can see the moon and I, I did that well two days ago. So that, that's my observing report. Anybody else? The uh, comet ZTF is still pretty good. I saw it last night. 
despite the full moon being not that far from it. And uh, we're hoping to look for it for the next few days as it begins to fade. But um, I wanted to let you know that there are not one ZTF comet, but two ZTF comets. The second one is fainter. It was in Cassiopeia and it's heading, heading away from that now. And I'm hoping to see it at some point in the next couple of weeks. And uh, so that's my observing report. Yeah, I'm a little confused about this, uh, the green comet ZTF. I, I keep seeing the news reports saying that, you know, it's not going to come back for 50,000 years, but on the JPL small body database browser, it's listed as a hyperbolic comet, which means it ain't coming back. So which is it? It is ain't coming back. I would definitely believe JPL Horizons or the Minor Planet Center way before I would believe the uh, regular press about any press, yes. comments. Okay, does anybody have any? Uh, oh, yes, Mark the comment. Mark, you want to And about this green thing, the only way it gets to be green is if you take a, uh, take a picture open. of it and, um, uh, and our add green from Photoshop. Otherwise, I don't think it's any greener than any other comet is. Yeah, agreed. Uh, first Friday of every month, Cranbrook's open for free, and the observatory is open on Friday nights also. So last Friday was actually a really clear night. I was able to come up. Uh, a lot of people up here. There had a lot of people uh, actually backed out the observatory door. So a lot of people got to see the comet. It was almost the full moon night, so the skies were kind of bright. So yeah, through their six-inch refractor, could barely see the comet, but it was uh, it was there. Do you have that information in the WASP about uh, the Friday nights? I don't think so. Ooh, hey Dale, can we get that information about the free uh, Cranbrook nights in the WASP? In the WASP? I'll, I'll, get, I'll get you in contact with Marty. We'll get that in the WASP so we can get our membership to know about it. Okay. Thank you. If anyone else has an observing report before I go, now is the time for what you may have seen. Anybody uh, observing report? We're going to get some pictures now? Uh, we might. Awesome. Wow. Yes. Kelly is waving his hand. Go ahead. Kelly. Kelly? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know if it was me or not. I didn't hear my name. <clears throat> I saw the comet the night of the 31st, and it was way up in the sky, maybe 60 degrees up, and it was close to the moon, so I was surprised to even see it. But uh, it looks, I didn't see any of the tails that were in the pictures that I've seen around that time, though. And I was using uh, 10 by 50 binoculars and got a, maybe a centimeter by centimeter speck of uh, uh, frostbite. But it doesn't hurt anymore, so I'm good going to share an image because of our so because of our bandwidth I don't know that image sharing is such a good idea but I will describe there was there was something else going on for you observers where where the where's Jeff you know there was a conjunction of the moon and Mars again that happened and it slid right underneath the radar because at the time comet ZTF was getting to be its brightest that it would be in the sky but um, in certain parts of the country, you could see Mars get occulted by the moon again. Um, up here, Mars and the moon got really close. I do have an image, and I will share it to anyone who wants to see it on break while we set up the, the um, while we while we set up the speaker. Um, other than that, I have seen some really good renditions. And yes, of course, the comet, uh, dicarbon is the reason all of these comets glow green when they are near us, far near enough to us to see them, and the sun is breaking down the elements in the nucleus. And so even Neowise, two years ago, which seemed to be forgotten in the media, um, glowed green as it came closer. And then because it was a larger comet, it uh, we were able to see a lot more detail and images of that were a whole lot easier to take but astro photographers such as bill beers and uh gary palmer were able to tease out that the tail it tails were going in opposite directions and um 
it had a it had a unique look to it for those that haven't seen pictures of it by now there's pictures all over media so you can look those up um but uh so our our green comet was a tough bin binocular object some of you have seen it i think you have you seen it marty in binoculars or jeff okay so others saw it in the telescope you know, we, adrian it, i i have a photo i could share of the comet let's let's see it go ahead and share your screen it won't kill our internet yeah it, this is <laughs> yeah there isn't anything uh yeah, we're seeing it. There we go. So, good astrophotographers wow. such as Dale Hollenbaugh. Um, you're seeing the green. That's dicarbon. You see that dust tail, and I believe this. Is, so, I want to say that's the ion tail that's pointing away Isn't from. Is this the dust tail? That's the dust Isn't tail. This that, is the ion tail. Yes. Yeah. And so. The comet's receding, but at the angle that we see it, it's a rather unique angle. Um, if you can imagine when Neowise came, you could see the ion tail and the dust tail at a different angle. Here, this comet is facing in such a way that um, the ion tail is shooting this way. The dust tail at one point, the dust tail was um, almost opposite kelly i saw your hand up go ahead and uh oh that wasn't ahead. a hand i was just uh uh, uh applauding his picture okay hey, dale uh, how, what's the how what's the time on that exposure okay so um this is uh 69 frames each one is one minute long stacked so the total exposure time is 69 minutes. Uh, it's an 11 inch refractor. I used a hyperstar, so I brought down the focal ratio to f1.9. So, so that brings in an incredible amount of light because I wanted to to get this. Um, I did have other other frames. There's a lot of clouds coming through, high clouds. Uh, so I made an animation because this moved really fast. And the animation is low quality, but you can see it move. <laughs> see how the internet works. It's working fine. We can see it moving. So this is, oops, blanked out for a second on my screen. So this is a four hour, yeah, there's the clouds. <laughs> this is just sort of raw data, all blink image. Um, and then here at the end, the, the last bit at the end is actually what I used for my my thing there, the last bit. Uh, but that's four hours, and it, it, it trucked across the sky pretty fast. So, so where, what constellation was it near when you took this image? Yeah. <laughs> little little dipper, I don't know. If I, I know it. It, it, it was uh, due north of Polaris. Okay. I know it I mean, hung out. Yeah. Part is a lot. Um, for a while, okay. probably still around there. So, I can yeah. see it visually with my binoculars, but not the naked eye. I, I got I got too too much lights near me. Yeah, we're gonna get a we're gonna get an SQML reading from your site. Uh, yeah, that'd be interesting. We want to know. That's one thing I've been doing is getting SQML readings. What that is is I have a meter that checks sky darkness. And so we look up at the sky and we go, this is a dark sky. Look at all the stars. But for some of us, some skies are darker than the others. So in order to quantify that, and especially with my images, where I do a lot of landscape, widescape images, I take the SQL meter to get readings and I include those along with any settings if I'm doing anything. Um, I Again, I do more widescape. Dale's really good at this work where he does um, that's going in the calendar next year right yeah Dale Timmy I think we have one, we have one calendar object now we just need another 11 plus to cover we're working on it but that's how I get accurate numbers so when someone says it's dark I can say is it 20 point 
four nine dark, which is the edge of Bordel five and Bordel four? Is it twenty one point two dark, which is Northern Michigan? When I get to the UP, the number I expect here is 21.3, 21.4. And that's when the Milky Way begins to have color. Way over here in Oklahoma in the Panhandle, 21.95 to 21.99 at the best. Bordel 1 is 22 and above. Milky Way has shape, color, looks like the pictures that I take, naked eye. It is, and the rest of the Milky Way is easily visible. So. Those of you who know and love your dark skies, the, it gets darker, but we are finding with the SQM readings, other observation, those numbers are getting higher. They were rating these as Bortal 3 sites. Well, I have proof that they're Bortal 4 sites now, high Bortal 4. Still impressive, but not the Bortal 3 sites that they were in 2015 or 20, I think 2018, something like that when those those readings and this dark sky park for those who can't see on the web it's lake hudson sits at the board it sits at the border of portal four and portal five it used to be a lot darker but it is losing its light pretty fast so those readings okay any other reserve observing reports before we have our uh, short presentation tonight i've got one so, mm -hmm. so some member who's going to be going somewhere, and they say, you know, maybe this will be a useful place to get a reading. If they contact me, you can take my borrow, take it up with you, and serve for vacation, whatever. Okay, thank you. So, um, do we have, before we start our short presentation, which will be just a minute, do we have any questions? I've asked an astronomer. Any questions from the audience? Okay, then, Dale, let's introduce our uh, short speaker presentation for tonight. I was going to say, if you had questions about what Dale Hollerball said about his image, he see his after mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. He's got to, we got to get him set up, yeah. yeah. So let's take a few minute break here and get our speaker set up. Oh no, this is for, this is David, right? Who's, no. who's our small, who's our first no. speaker? This is for Jacob Callum's. Okay. Our show, who's going to give a short presentation. Oh, so giving a small stress. Okay, so we're going to have to squeeze this out. I want to go on snack break. Okay, we're going to lose you all temporarily. Go ahead and. Okay, so you're ready? Yes. All right, let's just. <clears throat> Okay. All right, there you go. Oh, and I will move. Uh -oh. Okay. 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 Unmute. Okay. Dale Teamy, wave if you can hear me. Okay, we're good. Okay. Through Adrian's technical wizardry, <laughs> I think we're good to go here. Uh, tonight, our short presentation will be given by Jacob Caleb's. Is that how you say it? Caleb's. Caleb's. Um, I'm really happy that he's here. He's a 
It's his first time here. He's a third year undergraduate student uh, at Wayne State University. He's majoring in physics and intends to pursue a doctorate in astrophysics. Uh, in preparation for that, he's currently doing undergraduate research at Wayne State on active galactic nu nuclei. He's also the president of the Wayne State University chapter of the Society of Physics Students and is a show host at the Wayne State Planetarium. Jacob's presentation tonight concerns a novel approach to echo mapping of supermassive black holes. Hang on to your chairs. <laughs> Echo there you go. Mapping. You're on. Thank you. Turn on the video here real quick. Turn off the kill switch. Start video. All right. Hi. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. As Dr. Parton said, my name is Jacob Calebs. I'm an astrophysics major at Wayne State University. Uh, let me just bring up the proper slides. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you guys can see that, and can we see it in the uh, video? This is your monitor right here. So oh, that's what they see? Yep, that's what they Beautiful. See. Awesome. All right, so this is a novel approach to echo mapping of super black, massive black holes. This is the research that I've been working on with Dr. Kackett over at Wayne State University ever since. Yeah, it's still playing on there. Uh, this is the research that I've been working on with Dr. Cackett over at Wayne State University ever since last year in May. Um, so let's get into it. So as Dr. Barton said, this is research concerning active galactic nuclei or AGNs. Uh, active galactic nuclei are supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that actively have gas and dust falling into them. Uh, we believe the small fraction of the largest galaxies across our universe are considered active galaxies as they have these supermassive black holes in their centers. Um, and the supermassive black hole essentially acts as the powerhouse of the AGN system. Uh, and this infographic we have here, this is kind of a unified standard model of the AGN system to our current understanding. In the very center, we have the supermassive black hole. Um, is this a, no, sorry. Um, in the very center, we have a supermassive black hole, which can be millions to billions times the mass of our sun. Um, outside from the black hole, we have what we call the corona, which is kind of the X-ray emitting atmosphere that surrounds this black hole. Um, surrounding that region, we have this visibly thick, disk of dust called the accretion disk. This is the gas and dust that orbits the black hole and slowly falls into it in a process known as accretion. Now, accretion is an incredibly efficient way of releasing energy into, into uh, space. So as matter falls in, it loses gravitational potential energy and releases that energy. You also have all the gas and dust rubbing up against each other in a very hot, viscous fluid, essentially, which can emit in X-rays. Um, outside from the accretion disk in the pink region, we have what we call the broadline region, uh, denoted BLR. Um, this is the optical region because many, this region is mostly hydrogen gas clouds that surround all around the accretion disk. Uh, so, of course, as hydrogen gets excited in some pictures that you might see, you see the beautiful red glow that it gives off. Uh, hydrogen, when it's excited, will de-excite and, re and release in different optical wavelengths of light for us to see. 
Um, outside from the broadline region is what we call the dusty torus, which is basically just a big donut of gas and dust uh, that obscures our view of the Aegean system. Sadly, not something that we can eat. <laughs> uh, so a few examples of AGNs that we have include the beautiful M87 galaxy. In this image that you can see here in the very center is that very bright white dot. That is the AGN system. It goes to show just how efficient the accretion process is because the AGN system can actually outshine the entirety of the galaxy. Uh, the beautiful blue line that you see coming out from the center is actually a subatomic particle jet being blasted out from the black hole. Uh, so, of course, M87, for those who may keep up on their black hole stuff, uh, this is the galaxy that we actually got the first pictures of a black hole of in 2020 um, by the Event Horizon Telescope. But this picture here is from NASA uh, using Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope. On the right side, we have another beautiful active galaxy named Centaurus A. Uh, this image that you see here is a composition of X-ray, optical, and U and uh, excuse me, infrared images that have been stacked together. Again, in the very center, you can see that beautiful white dot that is the AGN system, outshining all the stars of that galaxy. Now, uh, why is the is learning about this important? Well, the accretion process, as I said, is a very efficient way of releasing energy. And these energy outflows that emanate from the black hole in the AGN system can actually go on to impact the rest of the galaxy. It can sweep out gas and dust in the nucleus of the galaxy, which could either stop star formation by blowing away all that gas, or by blowing away all that gas and compressing it, can actually form stars. So understanding this mechanism for how the energy outflows impact the nucleus of the galaxy can actually tell us how the rest of that galaxy is going to evolve. Now, the only issue with this is that oftentimes AGN systems are so small in the sky, mostly because the galaxies are so far away, the supermassive black hole is really tiny at that point, and so we're not really able to take a direct picture of it like we could in 2020 with M87. So in order for us to understand this process and to observe it, we actually have to observe it in an indirect way, which is where the research comes in. This process is known as reverberation mapping or echo mapping. It's, a, it's analogous to standing in a cave and shouting hello and waiting for the echo to come back to you. Any of these walls that are nearby me, the echo is going to bounce back and reach me very quickly. But on the far side of the auditorium, the echoes take longer to bounce off the wall and come back to me. That's exactly what's happening here with the reverberation reverberation mapping technique. As I said before, the accretion process is releasing X-rays and other high energy photons. So directly from the black hole, we see this continuum of energy streaming out from the black hole going directly to our eyes, or in our case, our different telescopes that make the observations, of course. But this energy is being emitted in all directions. So as we see in this infographic, from the black hole, maybe we have some of that energy travel out to a hydrogen gas cloud, such as in the broadline region. It will excite the hydrogen in that region. And of course, when it de-excites, as I said before, it will, it will uh, emit in an optical wavelength that we can see. So after traveling the extra path distance, it will then come back to us, but in a, in a longer wavelength, such as the H beta line. Um, so this, on the right side, this graph here gives us just a basic idea of what that data would look like. So the orange, up, the orange part up top is the continuum of energy. You see that it's varying because the accretion process is not very constant. We're going to have many variations in the data and the flux that we receive. And that goes on. We plot it over time. 
But then we also switch our detection so that we detect a different wavelength, specifically the H beta line, as I mentioned before. And we notice that the graph in blue lo looks the same general shape as the continuum of energy in orange. However, according to that dashed line, you can see that's shifted forward in time. And that is the time lag. It's the hydrogen gas cloud is like the other wall in this auditorium. It took longer for the energy to reach over there and then finally bounce back towards our eye. So because this is traveling at the speed of light, we can actually correlate this to a distance. Let's say that the two peaks there have a, dis have a time difference of six days. That correlates to a distance of six light days. So now, using that measurement, we now have an average size scale of the AGN system and just how large it is, at least to those hydrogen gas clouds. Well, the thing about this is that that is only giving us one single measurement. Okay, the system is six light, day, six light days in size. But many of these regions that we're looking at and want to observe are actually an extended geometry. It's a big cloud of gas and dust. So if we want to learn more, we don't. We need much more than just one lag measurement. And that's where this novel technique comes in that I've been working on since last summer. Uh, this process is what we call a frequency resolved technique. In, simplest, in a simple form, this is taking a range of frequencies where the lowest frequencies are farther away from the black hole and the highest frequencies are much closer to the black hole. And we get lag measurements over that range of frequencies. Now we can have a whole bunch of different lag measurements, but all of those will come together to describe a geometry, a shape of that gas cloud that we are observing in. So the goal of this project was to specifically target the broadline region in galaxy NGC 5548. It's a beautiful spiral galaxy. Uh, and this all came from observations in the UV and optical, which of course correlates to the hydrogen emission from the broadline region. So in terms of the actual data that was used, I'm using data from a paper done in 2017 by Pei. Uh, again, from NGC 5548, this was a part of the AGN storm campaign, which is a campaign to observe different AGN systems and collect this data. Uh, so you can see, just like a few slides ago in the orange, we had the continuum of energy. The top slide here is our continuum of energy, which has been observed by multiple ground based telescopes like LIC, Asiago, APO, and also from Hubble Space Telescope. The slide on the bottom titled H beta, that is coming from the from the broadline region, the hydrogen gas clouds. And if we were to really zoom in, we would notice that same uh, shift in time like we saw a few slides ago with the example data. So by processing this data through some Python computer code and some other programming to process the data for me, uh, we finally came to some general results. Now, in this graph, we have our lag over the range of frequencies that I was talking about before. We see here on the far left side towards the lowest frequencies, which are very, which are much farther away from the black hole and ionizing region, we have our highest lags, which makes sense. The farther away, the longer it's going to take for that to echo back to us. But as we increase our frequency, the lag goes down. It takes, a, it takes less time for that echo to reach us because it's hitting a gas cloud that's much closer. Uh, the green dashed line that you see on there is actually the result that Pei got in 2017. Uh, that, but as you notice, it's only one measurement. The measurement specifically is 4.17 days. And as I said, that's only one measurement versus the five data points that I've collected, which describes a geometry. So we have our data. Now, what exactly can we do with this? How do we understand this data to figure out what is the shape of the broadline region? Well, we can create a few models. Now, these models describe different geometries. Let's say, for example, that I think that the broadline region is a, is a torus, a donut. 
Um, I can take a equation, which we call a response function, and it will spit out a model that shows, okay, if it really were this shape, we would get some sort of lag versus frequency graph, which I can then correlate to my data and compare it and say, okay, my model looks just like my data. Therefore, the broadline region is this geometry. I'm currently in the process of making these models. I'm going to be doing different geometries like a torus, a more conical, which it gets thicker the farther away we go, and a few others that I'm going to discuss with my professor to create these models. And uh, once I can compare them to my data, I will finally have a definitive idea of what shape the broadline region is. Uh, that should be expected to be done around April. Uh, so just as a little summary, uh, supermassive black holes essentially act as the powerhouse of active galactic nuclei and can actually go on to impact the entire evolution of the galaxy by sweeping away dust and either causing or halting star formation. Uh, to understand these systems, we use a technique known as reverberation mapping, analogous to shouting hello in a cave and waiting for the echo. Uh, using this technique, we can actually get multiple lag measurements over a range of frequencies so that we can understand the geometry of the broadline region, which emits in the optical wavelengths. Uh, so far, I have created, a, I have gotten my main lag versus frequency graph, and I plan to create some models to finally understand the shape of the broadline region. Do we have any questions? Yes. Um, with the position of the torus looking at you, but because you're looking at it like that, mm -hmm. goes flat on. Does that change now, the readings at all? Are you saying torus as in the dusty torus that we're talking here? Yeah, or? Yeah. Whatever, whatever you're looking at, it's, 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 it's all going to have angles and less than that. Sure, so sure. You're looking at you like that, mm -hmm. it's going to be coming at you. Mm -hmm. so the torus is there something there labeled broadline region? Because I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, this right here is called a broadline region. Okay. All right. Yeah, the pink region on there is what we call the broadline region. That's the hydrogen gas class that I was describing. Uh, to, to answer your question. Um, so repeat the question. Yeah, so the question was, does the orientation of the dusty torus impact our results? And yes, it can. Uh, the dusty torus, if it's if it's so that if you're looking at a donut edge on, but the black hole is right where the hole is, um, that is going to obscure our view of the continuum of energy that comes from the black hole. It has to travel through all that gas and dust, and that can lower our flux measurements. But because of just how high energy it is, we'll still be able to see it. Versus if the black hole, if the entire system was tilted, so now you're looking right through the hole of the donut, um, that will, that's just a very direct um, blast of the continuum. But of course, the continuum of energy that's coming from the black hole is emitting in all directions. So we can see it, but if it's more edge on, it's going to be obscured a little bit by the dusty torus. Yes. Any other questions? I assume. Love the planetarium. Oh yeah, the planetarium, of course. So as Dr. Parton said, I'm also a present. What? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh. Just a moment. Um, so I'm also a presenter at the Wayne State University Planetarium. We have public shows every Friday. Uh, the very the very first oh, you might have to mute. <laughs> uh, the very first Friday, Friday of the month is always dedicated to our Wayne State community, so only students, faculty, staff, and whatnot. But all the rest of the Fridays of the month are dedicated for public shows, completely free admission. We have a show at 6 o'clock and at 7.30 each of those nights. Uh, you just have to register on Eventbrite, where you can find the Wayne State Planetarium, get your tickets, and come enjoy a show, most likely by me. Any final questions? Any final questions on WebEx? No?
Jacob, thank you very much. Really interesting. Very welcome. Um, I think there were maybe a couple or so of people I who came at this. after we did introductions of new people. Yes. Can you introduce yourself? Exactly. My name is Janice Messer. I've been here. My true superpower is getting lost. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I would like to introduce my friend Peter Jedicky, who is uh, from London, Ontario, Canada. And he's Bob, what's next? In our lecture uh, break. Yeah, we're going to take a short break now, a snack break, or for you online, a bio break. Maybe you can get a mochi. But we're going to meet again at uh, 8.30. So take a nine minute break. Be back. Yeah, we got, we got, we got, we do. We are back on. Me. All right, so take a break. Back and through. Hey, thank you. Adrian, can we? Oh, God. Adrian, can we try once more? Let's see if I can get the sound to work. On the uh, on the sharing, how do I do that to get the sound of the music to share? Yeah, we're up. We're up. Are you there, Adrian? Yeah. Or anybody who could help me see if we're getting the music. I don't think the uh, audio is feeding through the uh, Cranbrook system right now. I don't know exactly what you're turning I mean, we're good, but my turnout is looking at so If you want to try the music sound, uh, go ahead and try it. They're not listening to in Cranbrook at the moment. Yeah, um, so I guess somehow it looks like it's going to be on the interesting start of um, like drumming up to like who said like the bird drive the chain discussion. So if you want to get all parts of the stuff, me and my grandson. That's typical. No, that's I think so. the discussion group is kind of a big expression. Some people like spend a kind of drink, sell so snacks, so the people is cool not as much. Well, I think so, yeah, it's a completely separate entity. Yeah. 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 So, okay, well, I'm going to try to share my screen now. And, okay. Uh, and I think I figured out. So, are you looking for the one that we have? If someone's interested in being looked at, I'm trying to find the right thing for them. Okay, let's see here. Here. Uh, get this right. Okay, now we're going to there. And uh, let me try this. I can't seem to get this. No. So I just 
Okay, I just can't seem to get it to share for you. Oh. Okay, I will try one more time, and if I can't get it, I'll just not use it. Now. Okay. Hey, it should be sharing yep. now. You're starting to share content now. Okay. And like, are you getting the stars? Not yet. It seems to be stuck at starting to share. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, so are you seeing the uh, big first sketch of our comments? Yes, I'm seeing the whole PowerPoint uh, program there with the, the first slide. Thank you very much. Okay, so that didn't seem to work. It almost is working, but it's not. Did you click on from beginning? Yeah, let me try from the beginning. Yeah, click on that uh, from beginning uh, icon there. And that should show the whole slideshow. Well, that's what I'm doing. It's not. It's not letting me. Yeah, it's just not. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. For me, I just put that piece. My colleague, Matt, they have a text. And I was playing around with it. I'm trying to get Adrian's attention, too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, I'm going to switch to I'm not going to use it. It's getting too complicated. Um, yes, alright, I will be at one of these events. Thank you. So, it's 8.30, so everyone get back to your seats and let's uh, get ready for a presentation. Okay. David, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you just fine. I did not have to do this. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Okay, go ahead and test the V. Okay, I'm all set. Okay, you're all set. I'm all set. You just get me. Why do that? Okay, so he is all set. Okay, let's make sure we can hear you in the audience, David. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you from here. Let's. Oh, great. Okay, at oh. least you can hear me. That's the important part. Okay, um, we're ready for our main speaker. Um, David Levy, I have to say, David, uh, I learned some things about you, and they were all impressive. Uh, David Levy is arguably one of the most enthusiastic and famous amateur astronomers of our time. Although he has never taken a class in astronomy, he has written over three dozen books on the topic. He has written for three astronomy magazines, has appeared on television programs featured on the Discovery of the Science Channels. Uh, he regularly publishes in our uh, WASP newsletter an article. Among David's accomplishments are he discovered 23 comets. I, I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, the most famous of which was, of course, Comet Schumacher Levy. Nine that collided with Jupiter in 1994. He's um, also discovered hundreds of asteroids. Um, he has uh, a PhD from Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, in 2010, which combined astronomy and English literature, hence. He often reads us a poem having to do with astronomy in our meetings. And he hasn't quit with all of that. He continues to hunt for comets and asteroids and lectures worldwide. And he is a member of the Warren Astronomical Society. <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, David's topic tonight is entitled of Comets love and poetry. David, you're on. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me and see me now. <clears throat> um, okay. I would like to begin with a, with a commercial message. Um, I, the, 20, the 23rd odd books or something that I've written, that number has just been increased by one because I have a new book out now and it's called Clipper, Cosmos and Children. Finding the Eureka Moment. And I'm holding a copy of it right here. And uh, it's meant for children, but it's also meant for children at heart. So if any of you have children or grandchildren, 
that you would like to introduce to this guy, this book might be a way of doing it. It's available on Amazon. What you need to do is if you go on Amazon, just go to their book section and then type in Clipper, comma, Cosmos, and the book should come up. And um, I think the retail on Amazon is 1995. So the book is available on Amazon. And it's a book about a magic beagle that takes a group of kids on a romp through the night sky. And uh, we talk about comets and we talk about everything. There is even a chapter on the great voids and um, chapter on the sun, chapters on the planets and on the great mega clusters, super clusters of galaxies in the night sky. And so I'm hoping that some of you will be interested in that. I'm unable to autograph them tonight because I'm not there in person, but at least you can get it over on Amazon. I'm going to talk tonight about my comet discoveries that have taken place over the years, but I need to begin with the most important discovery of all, which is not a comet. The most important discovery that I've done is not a comet at all, but of the idea that comets and the night sky can be related not just to we amateur astronomers, but to everybody else in the world. Artists, poets, writers of all different languages. And that discovery took place pretty suddenly, even though I've been interested in astronomy since I was a child. I have, I never realized the idea of the nature of the night sky being available to people of other, of other, of other vocations in the world, to artists, to poets, to writers of novels, to politicians. And I've always, I've always imagined that if you want to run, say, for um, for the House of Representatives, if you want to be a representative, the idea is that you should have to have identified at least half the constellations in the night sky in order to do that. If, on the other hand, you want to run for the Senate of the United States, you then have to be an, a, 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 a stalwart variable star observer and have been a member of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. If, however, you want to go all the way and run for President of the United States, I think you have to have discovered not one, but at least two comets to be able to be eligible for that. I don't know if that will ever happen. I'm sure it won't, but those are just some ideas if you want to run for a political position in the United States. <clears throat> Anyway, the discovery of the relationship between astronomy and poetry took place in late April of 1977. I was then married to my, what I call my practice wife at the time. That was a marriage that did not last very long, but we were in Montreal with a group of amateur astronomers observing the Lyric meteors at the end of April of 1977. The very next day, I was scheduled to leave for Kingston, Ontario to meet with my proposed thesis administrator. We were going to discuss what I was going to do. I still had no idea what I was going to do. And we were watching the sky. It was clear and there weren't a lot of meteors, but there were a few here and there, a couple of bright ones. And I looked up at the sky quietly and I thought, I wonder how many other amateur astronomers around the world are looking at the lyrics tonight. And then I wondered, wait a minute, I wondered how many people who are not into astronomy, poets, 
writers, all kinds of people, artists, have looked at the night sky and have seen shooting stars. And right away, I had my answer that I was going to write my master's thesis on the night sky in English poetry. The next day, we went to Kingston and we met Dr. Norman McKenzie. And right away, I told him what my plan was. And he liked the idea. And he immediately introduced me to one of his favorite poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And Gerard Manley Hopkins was quite the um, quite the English poet. I think those of you who have studied him in high school, have studied him in high school, would be aware that he is one of the most complex and difficult poets in all of English poetry to understand. He has very complex rhyme schemes. He's very difficult to read, very difficult to interpret. And I think for most of us, the best thing about Gerard Manley Hopkins is when we finish studying him and we can go on to another poet. This is really quite true about Hopkins with the exception of one magic poem that he wrote when he was a student at Oxford University at Balliol College. <clears throat> he witnessed the passage of Temple's Comet and he decided to write about it. He decided to write a poem about the passage of a comet. The idea that a person can actually be compared to a comet. I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovering. In some corner seen bridging the slender difference of two stars come out of space or suddenly engendered by heady elements for no one knows. But when she sights the sun, she grows and sizes and spins her skirts out while her central star shakes its cocooning mists. And so she comes to fields of light. Millions of traveling rays pierce her. She hangs upon the flame cased sun and sucks the light as full as Gideon's fleece. But then her tether calls her. She falls off. And as she dwindles, sheds her smock of gold amidst the sistering planets, and then goes out into the cavernous dark. So I go out, my little sweet is done. I have drawn heat from this contagious sun. To not ungentle death, now forth I run. I fell in love with this poem. I just loved it. And as we studied it in that first year of graduate studies in English, I think my advisor realized how excited I was about that poem. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> he was, I was excited and I remember trying to figure out which comet he had in mind. I've already told you that it's Temple's Comet of 1864, but I didn't know that at the time. I first looked back in ancient literature about Donati's Comet of 1857, and he said, oh no, that's far too way, too far advanced. It's almost a decade before he wrote that poem. <clears throat> I then thought about the great comet of 1861, the comet discovered, <coughs> excuse me, the comet discovered by Tibet from Australia and then became very, very bright. I know Tennyson observed that comet and enjoyed it. So then I thought it was that. But Dr. McKenzie said, that's also a little bit too far in advance. And then going down the list, there was um, Comet Swift Tuttle in 1862, which we now know as being famous as the parent comet of the Perseid meteors. And again, that was two years before the events of the poem. But then I got to Comet Temple. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Then I got to Comet Temple Rispigi of 1864. And that became fairly bright and visible during the summer of 1864. And I was all excited. I thought that's gotta be the comet. 
I went into Dr. McKenzie's office and I said, I think I've got it. From a temple, Temple's Comet of 1864 is the comet that I believe. Temple's Comet was the comet that I believe was the comet Hawkins was writing about. And Norman looked at me and said, no, I think you're wrong again. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. A second, the second and third lines of the poems, I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovery, in some corner seen bridging the slender difference of two stars. We need to have a comet that was actually in between two bright stars. And this comet does not qualify. And I sat up and I looked at Dr. McKenzie and I said, on, in the uh, Illustrated London News, it specifically says that on Monday last, ne on Monday next, the comet will be in between Iota Aurigae and Beta Tauri, two stars. Couldn't those be the two stars? And uh, he said, no, those could not be the two stars. The reason they couldn't be the two stars is very simple. And that is an Iota star is a lot fainter than a Beta star. So there's no way you can see those two stars together. I had them. Dr. McKenzie, I said. I, I am familiar with those two stars. Orga has a lot more bright stars in it than Taurus does. So Iota, Iota Orga is not much fainter than Beta Tauri. He said, are you sure? And I said, I am positive. I know those stars. He said, I'm not gonna argue with someone who knows the sky. You've got it. That's the comedy must have been writing about. And he immediately said, this will be the major chapter of your master's thesis. I completed it with great difficulty within the next couple of years. I got my master's degree and I decided enough of formal education. I'm now going to relocate to Arizona and do what I really wanted to do all along and discover my own comet. I even said that I would probably, that I would probably, um, be happy to discover one comet, maybe two, but certainly one, and then move back to Montreal where I belonged. I start. I started back down there. The first season that I was there was a very beautiful, clear autumn sky. It was clear for I think over 70 nights in a row were clear. <laughs> I was able I was able to do a lot of searching for comets. <clears throat> 1979 turned into 1980, 1981, 1982 and 83. And with all of that, even though I was doing hundreds of hours of searching for comets, I had yet to discover a comet. In November of 1983, I did make an independent discovery of Comet Hartley IRAS. Excuse me, sorry about my voice today. Anyway, anyway, so um, I missed that by just a couple of days. In fact, a friend of mine said that was Comet Hartley IRAS almost leaving. Well, but that was true, but I still had yet to find my own comet. 1983 turned into 1984. And I remember being on, having dinner with a friend of mine at the time. That friend has since passed on. And, um, but we had a wonderful dinner and we're talking and she was going to lead a lecture in the planetarium, of course, which goes back to the first lecture that we heard this evening. And so as we're talking, I'm kind of looking past her out the window and I'm noticing the clouds beginning to dissipate. And she stopped talking and she looked at me and she said, it is clearing outside. And I said, uh-huh. She said, you are going to leave me here, aren't you? 
And I said, uh-huh, you're going to abandon me here. You're going to go home and you're going to search for comets. And I said, yeah, except I'm not. We're going to finish our dinner, pay for it, and then I'm going to leave you and go and hunt for comets. And as I got into my automobile, she said, okay, David, stand me up. That's okay. But you sure better discover a comet for me tonight. I went home, set up my 16-inch diameter telescope named Miranda, turned it and started searching in the west. The rose like I did. Searching the comet. Like I'm searching down the sky. I picked up the modular star cluster in Hercules, picked up another object, and then the telephone rang, and I'm concentrating on talking to the person who I was talking with, a friend of mine. <coughs> Excuse me again. And um, and uh, with an eye of the eyepiece, I'm searching for comets. And then my telescope alighted on NGC 6709, a very nice, pretty open cluster. And right next to it, was a fuzzy spot that I hadn't noticed before. And in the middle, in mid-sentence, I cut myself off and I said, oh my. And uh, my friend said, what do you got? Is it a cluster? I said, no. It doesn't seem, it seems to be nebulosity, but no, no, um, there's no asterisms, no stars involved. And it is very close to the open cluster 6709. I took out my map, star map, and made a little sketch as to where it would be relative to the nearby stars. And we continued talking for a few moments while I'm looking at this thing. And suddenly I said, I better get off the phone. I need to take care of this. And I looked at through the telescope again, and I thought, Levy, you really don't know how to sketch, do you? <clears throat> Because you put the telescope, you put the object right next to this, right next to this cluster, but the comet as it's moving, as the object as it's sort of moving along, is a lot closer to the cluster than you drew it. So draw it again. So we put X's through the sketch and I put the comet. I did another sketch of the object. And then I looked again. And the object was even closer to the cluster now. And I said, this is the second time you blew it. Do a third sketch. And then the thought entered my head. That, that is a moving object. It's a comet. And after 917 hours and 28 minutes, I had discovered a comet. But was it a known comet? I didn't know. I called a friend of mine, Brian Skiff, at the Lowell Observatory. He answered the phone. I told him I had something, but I, it's, I'm pretty sure it's a comet, but I'm not certain if it's known or not. And I gave him the position. And the phone rang again about 15 minutes later. And he said, send a telegram immediately. That's a comet. And it's a new one. So I sent a telegram. It's the only one of all the comments that I've found in my life that I've been able to send one telegram for. All the rest I did over email. And I gave the position and uh, the RA in the deck and the magnitude of about 9.5. And I sent it. And then I called the person I was talking with before to resume our conversation. He was no longer interested in what we were talking about. He said, I had a feeling when you didn't call me back right away that you had spotted something interesting. And we talked about it for a while, got off the phone, took a long, long walk that night and came back. And it was really very, very special. <clears throat> it was very, very special that I was able to come back. By this time, the comet had set and all I had to do was wait. I felt that I'd been climbing a cliff all those years. And I was going up. And that on this night, my left hand had finally reached the top of the cliff. 
and I was spending the next day putting the rest of me over the top. Would it be a new comet or not? The next night I was out observing again, looking at the comet. Obviously it moved quite a bit past NGC 6709. And while I was looking at it, the telephone rang. And it was the director of the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, Brian Marsden. He said that another amateur astronomer, Michael Rodenko, just about an hour ago, reported the same comet. So we are going to name it Comet Levy Rodenko. After 19 years, I had finally found my first comet. Hung up the phone and uh, I really just couldn't say anything. I could hardly speak. And I took another long walk that night and uh, that became my first comet. It didn't take too long for me to find my second one just a few years later in 1987. And my third one just about a hundred hours after that at the end of 1987. And then a fourth one in 1988. Two weeks after I found that fourth one, another comet, Shoemaker-Holt was discovered. And um, I got a letter from Gene Shoemaker saying that it was interesting that you reported this, your latest comet discovery, because we were actually searching for it to get an image of it when we alighted on our own comet, Shoemaker-Holt. And it was actually kind of an interesting story because we set the telescope to where we thought your comet was, took an image of it, and, and Carolyn looked at the, we developed the, the film, Carolyn was looking at it, there was the comet, and uh, I came down to take a look with her, and uh, I'm saying, Carolyn, you got the totally wrong position. You got the RA and the deck mixed up somehow. And, oh, that's why I can't identify any of the stars in this image. And, uh, yeah, so they all laughed out a good laugh about that. And Jean was about to go upstairs, and then Carolyn said, Jean, if that is not David's comet, what is this object that we're seeing here? It turned out they had discovered by, they discovered a new comet. And that comet became very interesting because about 12,000 years ago, there was one very large comet that split and it was probably at aphelion that the comet actually split apart into two pieces. And uh, the two of them came together. Comet Levy was the first one that came by and a couple of months after that, Comet Shoemaker Holt, the other component came by. And uh, so they got an interesting article about the splitting of comets. This was an unusual case of a comet splitting at Aphelion. Very interesting. Anyway, the end of that year, I finally met Gene and Carolyn for the first time. We went observing up on Mount Bigelow for a while. And on the way back, we're all in the car driving down from Mount Bigelow back to Tucson. And I said, Gene, I have a question I'd like to ask you, but I really don't know how to do it. And Gene said, well, David, <clears throat> there's only one way if you're not sure. What is the worst that can happen? I'll throw rocks at you and yell and scream and say, never ask another question again? I doubt that. So just ask the question. And I said, Gene, Carolyn, could I observe with you once or twice at Palomar? And Gene looked up and he looked at Carolyn and he said, oh, I would definitely think so. And so a few months later, I began observing with Gene and Carolyn. The first year in 1989 was pretty interesting. No new comments, but in November of 1990, we did find our first shoemaker Levy comet, a periodic comet. We found the second one a month later. In 1991, we found seven comets together, seven shoemaker Levy comets, and I found one of my own, a periodic comet. So there were eight comets that I had credit for that in 1991. 
92, there was just one. And 93, a very cloudy night. We could not observe the first night. The second night, the storm had cleared. We set up the telescope, put a, tele put a film into it, and uh, we took the first film. Gene developed the films right away to make sure they were okay. They were not. He called us downstairs and he said, these films are absolutely black. And Carolyn said, well, what the heck happened? And Gene said, someone opened this film box while we weren't looking. Turned out we knew who had opened this film box. It was the competition that was using the same telescope when we weren't using it. And uh, they no doubt, you know, the leader of that competition opened the telescope, saw all that undeveloped film inside and said, I think we better, oh my goodness, there's unexposed film here. I think we better close this film fairly quickly. Do you all agree with that? Yes, let's close the film quickly. And let's not tell anybody. <clears throat> So we had we had no film. Our film that had been carefully prepared for observing was totally useless for observing. And we were wondering what to do. And I said, Gene, the films were all stacked up on top of each other, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, what if we, what if we tried just to take film from the bottom of the stack, develop and see if that's any good? thought that wasn't a bad idea. So he did that and he took out the film, developed it as after it was developed and it was pretty good. The edges were light struck, but the um, centers, the centers were pretty good. And we thought we could continue that night, which we did. We continued that entire night using most of that bad film and by the end of the night, around three in the morning, we had a fresh batch of film, we were all set. Until the next night, when the clouds started to come in. And the three of us went outside, we're looking at the sky, it's looking really pretty bad. And I said, well, it's not too bad. You know, and Gene started laughing. He said, David, that's our enthusiastic David, always looking for a hole in the clouds. David, let me teach you something about how much this costs. Every time we slap a film into the telescope, it costs us $8. And uh, I said, well, that's not too bad, $8 to risk a film. And he said, that's eight American dollars, David, not that Canadian stuff you use. And but Carolyn's looking around and she says, you know, Gene, the sky is looking a little better. And Carolyn looked at Gene, Gene looked at Carolyn, they looked at me. And Gene said, let's do it. Let's risk it. Let's use the bad films because we're just going to destroy them anyway. We might as well get some observing done. The very next film that I took was the first of the two discovery films of the comet that later became known as Shoemaker Levy 9. On the 25th of March, Gene is... Um, reading Time Magazine, and uh, I'm reading, I'm just reading email or something, and Carolyn is scanning, and suddenly she stopped scanning, and she said, I don't know what I've got, but it looks like a squashed comet. And Jean right away thought, whatever a squashed comet is, i got to see what that looks like. And he looked through the, the uh, stereo microscope. <laughs> Carolyn came towards me, and I looked Carol, I said, you're joking, aren't you? And she said, no. And Gene looked at me with a look on his face, which absolute puzzlement. He had never, I'd never seen that look on Gene's face. And I had to take a look at this. And uh, there was the comet was really stretched out, but there were beyond the individual inner comas of all of the eight or nine pieces I could see was a bar of light that stretched out in either direction. And then going off to the top of the film, behind each one of those little inner comas, 
stretched a small tail. I couldn't believe it. We reported the comet and uh, and we just let it go. We described it as being most unusual. And the next day, the Central Bureau announced the discovery of comet Shoemaker leaving. And um, we let it go for a while. It was really very exciting, by far the most exciting comet we had ever discovered. And Jean suggested that the comet may not just be apparently near Jupiter in the sky, the comet may be physically, physically very close to Jupiter, and the comet might have had a catastrophic disruption by a too close encounter with Jupiter. It turned out she was correct about that. Two months later, on the 22nd of May, the weather was far, far better by now. And Carolyn was scanning. She would eventually discover a comet that day. But I am reading my email, and suddenly there's an announcement from the Central Bureau for astronomical telegrams. The announcement had to do with Comet Shoemaker Levy, now called Shoemaker Levy 9. They said that it's now obvious that the comet is not really in orbit around the sun, but instead in orbit around the planet Jupiter. And that it made a very, very close approach to Jupiter in 1992. And uh, that approach caused the comet to, to shatter, become in, into many pieces. It brightened the comet up a lot, allowed it to be discovered in March of 1993. We now know that it is in orbit about Jupiter. It is going to make another approach to Jupiter even closer than the one it made in 1992. It will actually come to within three Jovian radii of the center of Jupiter. And obviously, Jupiter's radius is 0.5. And so they, it obviously means that the comet is going to get much closer to the center of Jupiter than Jupiter's diameter is. I meant diameter there and there would be a collision. There was a second uh, announcement that came out saying that the calculations they did indicated about a 65% probability that at least some of the components of SL9 were going to collide with Jupiter between the 16th and the 21st of July of 1994. About three days later, a group from JPL did the same calculation. They came out with a 90 plus percent chance that all of the fragments would collide with Jupiter during that time. That was something. I remember the rest of that day, the three of us weren't saying very much because we were all hidden in our own deep thoughts as to what that would do. I remember in March of 1994, on a cloudy night, we're all sitting in the observing area. And I looked at Jean and I said, Jean, where are you going to be during impact week? And Jean said, well, Carol and I are going to be in Washington uh, because um, there is a spacecraft, the Clementine mission is going to be making a landing on the moon. And we need to be there to deal with that. Where are you going to be? And I said, I'll probably be out here in California where the weather will be nice and I'll be able to look at the uh, impacts as they happen. And uh, then I looked at Gene and he was looking at me funny. And I said, where did you say you were going to be again? And Gene said, Carolyn and I are going to be in Washington. And then he glared at me and said, where are you going to be? And I glared back at him. I said, I'll be in California. Where are you going to be? And he stood up and he said, we're going to be in, in Washington. Where will you be? And I said, Gene, I think I'm going to be with you guys in Washington. And that sense of relief, he said, I'm so glad you said that. Because if nothing happens, if this, is a, if this turns out to be a bum and nothing is seen, we need to have, find a rock 
And we're gonna need your help to find that rock to hide behind. Remember just before the impacts, there was an article, I think it was in Science, Science News, I think, and the article said, beware, the great fizzle is coming. And we really were thinking that they weren't gonna see anything. And as a lot of comets that pretend to be pretty bright as they get closer to the helium, flop as they get too close to the sun and then just vanish, we thought SL9 will probably find a way to do the same thing with Jupiter. We won't see anything. But it still was pretty exciting. We all met there in Washington, actually in Baltimore, on the 16th of July. We're in the um, press room, and he's, they're giving us advice on how to behave, how to hold our comportment during a press conference. <clears throat> how to sit, we put our jackets so that we're sitting on them so they won't appear to be wrinkled. And we're all practicing that when one of the people from upstairs, the Hubble Imaging Center, comes rushing down with a picture from the Space Telescope. <clears throat> and the picture showed a very bright image of, of a comet, of a comet impacting Jupiter there. And boy, did that interrupt the, the the, that interrupted completely the rehearsal we were having for that night's press conference. We ran to our computer to find news reports coming from all over the world. Everybody was seeing the impact spots. And uh, so at that press conference that night, we had a chance to talk about the discovery of the comet, much as I just did now, and uh, the preparation for the impacts. While we were doing that, Heidi Hamill walked in from upstairs with a photograph. And Jean was talking and Jean stopped and said, well, we have Heidi Hamill, who I think has some news for us right now. Heidi came in and she said, she said, well, Jean said we shouldn't be surprised with what we're going to see in the next week. And I can tell you, Jean, you ain't gonna be surprised. We saw a ton of stuff. And she showed that picture as raw as it gets right off from the space telescope of this very bright spot that's appearing on Jupiter's limb. And then she says, and that's just the first one, not the brightest one. We're gonna be in for a hell of a week. That was quite some week. We enjoyed it. To no uncertain terms, it was so much fun. We just had so much fun looking at that, looking at the comet. We got to go to the Naval Observatory uh, on the Wednesday night, right in the middle, and we saw a lot of impact spots. The next day, we were invited to the White House. We got to meet the president, it was President Clinton at the time. And just as the event was over, the actual event was held to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moonwalk. And just as that session was bre breaking up, one of the vice president's staff came to us and said, we'd like you to wait a while. The vice president wishes to talk with you. And we waited. He came in and uh, we had a wonderful conversation. It was not like speaking. It was not like anything political. It was like excited observers of the sky all talking about this comet. And I had at the back of my mind, you may be vice president of the United States, but I got to see the comet before you did. And I was thinking about that. And then Al Gore said, you know, I live on the grounds of the Naval Observatory. And I thought to myself, don't say it. And he went on and he said, two nights ago, walked to the observatory and someone you know, pointing at me, was running the observatory that night. And I just knocked on the door and asked if I could come and take a look at the impact spots. And he let me do that. I actually got to see them. And I thought, okay, so he even beat me to see the impact spots. Not too bad. That was a wonderful, wonderful 
week. And as the week ended, we were able to enjoy a final look through the telescope with just a few people. And it was just a very, very special, special time. I got back home, I flew back the next day and finally got a chance to get my life back together. And as we get, we now get to the final part of my presentation, my lecture tonight. All of this happened in the pre-Wendy years. I had met Wendy by that time. We were actually the result of a fix up. My mom and Wendy's mom were childhood friends from a camp in Maine. And they resumed their friendship a few months after my father died in 1985. And immediately they decided that they were going to get my mother's son, me, and Wendy's mother's daughter, Wendy, together. And they made it their mission to do that. And mom thought about this and she gave me Wendy's phone number and address. And I just sort of put it away. And I'd say every few months or half a year, she would ask me if I'd ever bothered to contact Wendy and I'd say no. And finally, seven years later, she asked me again. And I said, no, I haven't gotten around to it yet. Mom was really pretty angry. And she said, forget I even suggested her. I'm sorry I took an interest in your social life. Forget it. I took that as a challenge. The minute I got back to Tucson, I wrote to her. I wrote to Wendy. She wrote back. We finally had a conversation and we finally met on July the 7th or 8th of 1992. It was a wonderful meeting. I remember seeing her dressed in her summer clothes. She looked like a goddess. I didn't fall in love with her at that first sight, but I certainly noticed. And uh, what I really noticed, I was staying with Clyde and Patsy Tombaugh at the time, was when I got back to their house after our first date. And Patsy opened the door and she said, well, David, how was your date? And I looked at Patsy and I said, Patsy, I have just met Wendy and her sisters, the three most gorgeous women I have ever met in my life. For a while, our relationship just kept that way. It was very quiet. Then came the Shoemaker leaving an episode of my life. And I like to say, in retrospect, that I've made two good decisions in my life. A lot of bad ones, but two really good ones. The second best decision I ever made was to start searching for comets on the 17th of December, 1965. The first best decision I made was to fall in love with Wendy. In 1996, we were visiting Paris at a shoemaker leaving Line conference. I took Wendy to the top of the Eiffel Tower, proposed to her. For some reason, she accepted. We were married on March the 23rd, 1997, four years after the discovery of Carmen shoemaker leaving Line. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. And now I have a, um, I want to end it with something very deeply personal. Wendy was diagnosed with breast cancer about 10, 12 years ago. And for the first decade, she was doing very well. The medication she was on was doing, was taking, taking very good care of her. And she did beautifully about it. And in fact, our physician's assistant, who I really liked, said that it looks like that you're going to die with the breast cancer, not from the breast cancer. <clears throat> Uh, about a year and a half ago, the treatment just stopped working. They put her on something stronger, and also she had some surgery to have her ovaries removed. And they put her on chemo for a while after that. The chemo lasted until July of this of 2022. And that's when her body suddenly said, I'm done. I'm totally done. <clears throat> She insisted that I go to the Adirondack Astronomy Retreat, which was something that she had taken a very active role in organizing all those years. 
And, um, but while she was there, she needed to be taken to the emergency. I remember coming back from that retreat, just feeling absolutely horrible. And Wendy was barely able to walk by that time. And uh, it turned out that her body had just decided to reject everything. In September, early September, I called Wendy's sister who volunteered to come and help take care of her, which I immediately accepted. She came and about, by this time, Wendy was, was failing by the hour. A few days after our, her, our sister-in-law arrived, we had her, took her on a second trip to the emergency. And I was pretty certain that Wendy would not be coming home from that. She was moved from there into a hospice. And on the 23rd of September, at about 9.30 in the evening, Wendy died. As I come to the end of my lecture today, I have to honestly tell you, I don't know. I still do not know how I am going to continue without her. Every morning I wake up, I look at her side of the bed, and I'm thinking today is the day things are gonna go better. And I look over towards her side and there's no Wendy. And I think, okay, that takes care of today. <clears throat> but you know, I will get through this somehow. Life will go on and I will, I will somehow manage to get through this thing that has happened and the fact that I miss her so, so much. One of the things that Wendy loved was a poem that I like to do it was um it was um it was um by ralph hodson written in like 19 1918 the same year my mom was born and uh, that was kind of interesting that we were able to do it and i started to read it at the end of some of my lectures and then we used to have a radio show at the time and Wendy liked the poem so much, she said, let's do that at the end of every episode of your show. And then whenever I get a chance, in fact, once I was giving one of the short speeches here, and there would be time to finish, and Wendy would come up and show herself in the camera, and we would both do the quote together. So I'm going to end by, these, by quoting Wendy's favorite poem. I stood and stared. The sky was lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood. I knew not why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars. And still I stared into the sky. Thank you all very much. David, thank you very much for sharing. Do we not have sound? You do. Okay. David, thank you very much for telling us the story of the two loves of your life, uh, your wife and looking for and discovering comments. Uh, really amazing. You had a lot of applause here in the auditorium. Um, I well remember comment Schumacher Levy 9 when it hit Jupiter. Bam, 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 bam. Um, anyone have any questions either online or in the auditorium? I've got one. So, uh, so David, my good friend. As we got the news of your uh, of Wendy's death, whom I had heard on the phone, I had seen with you every time we did Global Star Party, and she talked to me when we bought your book, um, your auto, your your biography, um, and I remember that night, I think the night before, taking an image out at Okie Tex where there's thousands and thousands of stars. 
anybody who's been anywhere in Michigan, if you go out there and you look up, you see what David describes as thousands and thousands of stars. Maybe I'll share an image that I took out of there. Um, you, they streamed Wendy's funeral. And <clears throat> I knew that I would, <clears throat> and I knew that I would go virtually. I had to be there for my good friend. And I held it together. I'm sitting in our camper. It's during the day. And I held it together for a while as everyone came and paid their last respects. It was a very well run Jewish celebration. And at this point, setting my Catholic differences aside, we were all there for one person. And um, that was Wendy. David, when you took the stage and you finally came up to give your words, that was the point at which I lost it. It was great seeing you, my friend, when you were up there, full of smiles, and you had nothing but wonderful recollection. You were, you were happy that, I imagine you were happy that the pain had stopped. It came on so suddenly. We were getting news, those of us in the astronomy community. We, um, we learned, and then when we saw that email that you sent, um, I think all of us realized if we couldn't be in person, we would be online. Yeah. And so just so that you know, we were online supporting you during the last few days of Okie Techs. And we, um, we were there to celebrate with you Wendy's life. Uh, we thank you. Perfect ending for two major stories. And there's more stories to read in the book that you wrote while she was yet alive. So I wanted you to know that I was there with you, even if it was from uh, not so far away in Oklahoma. Yeah, I remember talking about that with you and uh, thank you. If you give me a few minutes at the end of the questions, there's another little quote that I would like to share with you, but let's do more questions first. No questions? We're, we have a question in the audience. This is sort of an interesting question. The green comet? Does anybody know if it's green? Yes. yes. I'm having difficulty hearing you. We'll, we'll repeat, the question. repeat the question. The question has to do with why this current comet is green. Do you have any comment on that, David? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. It ain't green. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, if you want it to be green, take a picture of it, put it in Photoshop, bring up the green filters, and then you'll have a green comet. That's the only way you're going to make this as green. Peter Jedeke, who is in the audience right now, he said that it's the the dicarbon molecule that can give it the green tinge, but um, the C2. But um, for whatever it is, I've, I've, I've never really seen it much as green. I've seen it as like every other comet. But it has its own, it has this beautiful tail that we noticed last night, a very broad fan-shaped tail. One of us saw a, spike, a spiked tail as well, but I couldn't confirm that, neither did Peter. But uh, anyway, there was a lot of stuff going on. Good question. Thank you for asking, but it wasn't green. Any other question? I have a question. David, you spent a few years looking for comets before you found one. And then later on, as you described your experiences, you discovered Seven, I think, comets, bam, 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 in like a year or so. Yeah. How did you do that? Well, seven of the eight that I found in, that I was part of the discovery team for in 1991 were Shoemaker Levy comets found photographically. And um, so for a while, I was searching both visually 
and I found one that year as well that was also periodic visually, plus the seven Shoemaker comments, Shoemaker Levy comments. And um, then more recently, a colleague of mine started doing um, started doing um, what do we call it? Uh, electronic observing with a telescope that he had in the in our in one of the observatories that he built in our backyard, and um, he he actually that that program did lead to a discovery of a comet. So one could say that I'm the first person to have discovered comets visually, photographically, and electronically, but I'm not really sure of that. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, David. I think well, if we'll... you don't mind, I'd like to. I'd like to end by this final little poem. It comes from Macbeth and Hamlet, and uh, the part from Hamlet is a direct stealing from uh, King Charles who said the same words in memory of his mom, Queen Elizabeth II. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day over 30 wonderful, <clears throat> unforgettable years to the last syllable of recorded time. Life is so much more than a walking shadow of frames who struts and threats their hours across the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, and it is a tale told by a genius, full of sound and light, signifying so, so much. And now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet Wendy. And may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Thank you. I'm going to see if we can send our video just so that you can see the crowd right here. Here they are. We were all watching. And now, if you want to give David a round of applause, he can now see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope to come and do an in person presentation to you at some point. But that'll be a while. I think. That would be awesome. Yeah. I need to go in person to Arizona. I still I, I still owe a drive. Yeah, you do. To Arizona. So I am gonna work on that. All right. So back to uh our president Bob Trembley to close. All right, well that concludes tonight's meeting. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, we typically go to uh, the Red Coat Tavern after this, but if you're going to order, you better leave soon because they stopped taking orders in, what, what, 10 minutes or something like that? So um, our next meeting will be a virtual Macomb on the 16th. So um, see you then. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone on the yeah. And thank you, David. Yep. Turn this. Yay. So, yeah, we preserved our bandwidth, but it looks like we probably could have gotten away without doing that. What's David's last name? It's Levy. David Levy. We call, all of us call him David because it is, uh,